Warning, the people you're about to see and hear are not who you expect them to be. The usual cast of lovable characters are off watching a man we call Girth get married. So for one night and one night only, you'll be on this ride that is Suns Basketball with a different group of lovable misfits. Now with that out of the way, let's hit that sexy, sexy sack. <laughs> Welcome in to another edition of the PHNX Suns podcast. We got the sexy sax as always, but a new cast of characters to groove to it. That is myself, Eric Ruby, usually just producing for the show. And I've got the two legends from Suns Twitter. I got Aaron Edwards and I got Steven Prigion. Guys, the Suns pulled out a win over the Charlotte Hornets. It was 107.96. They needed it bad after Boston, but we got a tradition around here, and it's going to make the people mad if I don't let the sexy sacks ride. So for the next couple of seconds, I need y'all to groove. Oh, yeah. It's feeling good. Listen, guys, <laughs> vibes are high. Go ahead and hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe to PHNX. Don't worry. The usual crew that you're here to yell out or love will be back on Sunday as the Milwaukee Bucks and the Phoenix Suns square off for a morning game. But for now, it's an OG's flavoring Friday. Shout out to OG's and all the fantastic stuff that they've got going on, guys. They've got a couple new products out there for you, including... This new cannabis gummy, the OG's Naturals, which is vegan, a.k.a. the Chris Paul gummy. And the Big OG's, which is a big, big gummy perforated in 10 little pieces if you're trying to have a fun time. Guys, leave a comment if you want. Super Chats will get right on screen. Go ahead and do that. But let's get into it right away. I'm just going to throw it to you, Aaron. Initial reactions to what was um, a pretty ugly game. Um, Other than the fact that it sounded like it was in an empty gym, um, it was... KD just has some of these games sometimes. I think it was kind of, we took the lead that we all thought we were going to take, but we all know how our fourth quarters are. So we were expecting what we ended up getting. And then just the overall vibes and the energy of that game was weird the entire time. Definitely weird the entire time. Vibes and energy here though, on point. And that includes my man, Steven. Steven, your main takeaways. Yeah, we saw kind of like the Cleveland game where they played, they played to the level of the competition. And then coming out in that third quarter, they had a big turnaround. The energy looked different. The fervor was different. The connectivity was different. The tempo was different. And it looked more like the team that we expect to see uh, down this home stretch, especially going against some of the the heavyweights that they have lined up in the schedule the rest of the way. Well, you mentioned the heavyweights, and you mentioned the energy in the third quarter. And to be honest with you, like I was watching, and I was like, okay, good. Like It was just one of those games where in the first half, you play down to your opponent. The Phoenix Suns tend to do that, and then you come on and you turn it on, and that's great. And they did, and then you get to the fourth quarter, and once again, they just disappeared. And I know it's 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 a win. It was 107-96, but I, I don't know if you guys got like – good vibes from this game because I, I personally I really did it and, and I'm a big like look for the positive types of guy me and flex get along great flex is always Mr. Positivity <laughs> I usually line up with him and a win is a win especially when you look at the standings in the west but Aaron man there was just certain points of that game where they were turning the ball over in a bunch of silly ways the offensive flow wasn't there and like th- those are the games to me that really stick out even though it was still a win yeah, I mean, they played a really physical team yesterday, and it was a back-to-back. So, like, I think that you kind of have to take that into account that you played probably one of the most physical teams in the NBA last night, and you're playing today. So, yeah, like, you gotta you kind of got to take some of that part into it. It's just you played Boston, and, of course, you might have came out a little slow because KD is 35. I don't hold all that against them. Like, KD is older, and this is a back-to-back, and he had, like, he did his best yesterday, but for the most part, I really can't be that mad about this game because 
Yeah, it's a grind, and they're on the East Coast road trip, and this game was probably always going to look like this. Do you play into that, Steven, the fact that it's the second end of a back-to-back? You just played the best team in the NBA the night before, and, and this game was physical. Like, Charlotte is a team that likes to muck it up. In fact, Steve Clifford even admitted that his talent level isn't that great, and so they have to try really, really hard in order to get wins. Is it just one of those games where style of plays clash, it's a back-to-back, and you just kind of write it off and say, at least they won? Yeah, I'm I'm always big on applying the context to things. And we talked about it in the pregame, the fact that it was somewhat of a trap game in a sense, coming behind behind a matchup with the Boston Celtics, being obviously the second night of a road back to back that they lost the first half of. There's pressure for them to just want to get that win. And like we talked about, win three out of four in this road trip against the Charlotte team that was obviously eager to make things happen, especially without a few of their better pieces, particularly with LaMelo Ball not being in the lineup. So there's a lot of little micro adversities that kind of added up to a hurdle for the Suns to kind of work themselves over. And it took them a, a half to kind of get acquainted with it. And then when we saw them finally put their foot down, we saw a team like we talked about. They were starting to have more of an expectation to see what more consistent consistency. So speaking of expectation, a lot of people are just, I mean, they're in the chat and they're not happy. And that includes a uh, psycho Hawk 2000. Listen, great name. You should be happier with a great name like that, Psycho Hawk 2000, but says pathetic performance, no matter how you want to cut it, and then like just a straight face emoji. Aaron, would you call this game pathetic? No, I mean, they came out slow. I think it was just both teams made it ugly. Like, I I can't take, like, I can't take away the back-to-back part of it, especially with the way, like, KD is one of our best players, and the back-to-backs are just going to be tough for him. We That's just going to be a thing especially this late into the season with the minutes he's played early on. So like, yes, it's frustrating, but they, they still go on the long stretches of getting buckets. And that's like why we can still trust them because they'll go on a stretch of going off and we can always trust them to at least do that, especially against a bad team. Like, yeah, against Boston, it was a struggle, but they're going to get buckets. And even when they have lulls, they're always going to probably click enough to, Get some bur- some buckets off. I mean, like, let's not gloss over the fact that they did win and and they limped, they limped to the end, but that third quarter showed a lot that can be built upon. And there was some pretty evenly spread out good performances. I don't think anybody really stood out. Like we were discussing star of the game, which we'll get to in a second, but nobody really stood out and was like, wow, they won that game because blank one person. <laughs> that's it. Nurk was in playing heavy on the boards. He was able to get some putbacks in there, set some physicality, get some text. Eric Gordon came back. Shot really well from outside of the arc. Grayson Allen turned it on a little bit in the second half as well. Book, not his best shooting percentage night from the field. Still did end up in a double-double. But KD back-to-back, like you mentioned, Aaron, was just uh, was just not, not what you want to see from him. But he's allowed to have those kinds of nights. But let's stick to the positive end, Stephen. What, like, uh, schematically did you see the Suns implement tonight that you think that they could build off of as they approach a hopeful playoff run? Yeah, well, we saw we saw more of Kevin Durant in movement. And if anybody follows me on Twitter or follows me on YouTube, one of the emph- points of emphasis for me, especially post-All-Star break, was eliminating a lot of those static post-touches where Kevin Durant has the ball and he's just holding it, essentially conceding for the defense to send two to him, which they almost do every single time he touches the ball. Rather than having those as the only kind of base that they're getting the ball to him in on the, within their offensive process, it's starting to blend in a little bit more him coming off of dribble handoffs and flowing into three-player actions like that, flowing off of stagger screens from the baseline, and just generally keeping him in movement, including the DHOs with Nurkic in the, uh, in the empty corner. I think just keeping a healthy blend of those things in addition to those mainstay uh, post touches for him where there's not much movement going on from him in particular is important because obviously he can be, he can be easily targeted in terms of the defense having – essentially a big portion of their game plan set up to take the ball out of his hands. So the more you can mitigate those stagnant touches to keep him in movement, the more dynamic your offense gets and the more you make him a movement target. Uh, just It adds so much abundance to the offensive process. So I think that was maybe one of the bigger things in addition to Devin Booker continuing to play well off of garnering the extra attention that he does in pick and roll. And I think using guys like Kevin Durant more off the ball, like you said, instead of a stagnant post up, especially when you've seen him struggle a little bit, when doubles have been sent to him and making that quick decision and that quick pass leading to some turnovers, getting him to move a little bit more. And guys, it's less energy 
to just move around the court than it is to move and dribble the ball and dribble the ball and dribble the ball and have two guys sent to you and now you're getting physically beat up and you're thrown around over there. But a big part of that working is Yusuf Nurkic and he did grab a lot of rebounds today, but he had some pretty nice passes and he kind of unlocks everything. Aaron, from your perspective here on Nurk, like just how much of a different element does he bring to maybe some other centers either on the roster or in a son's past? Um, like Book said on JJ Pod, like once he gets the blitz and Nurk comes to the middle, they trust him to make the next decision after that. And he pretty constantly makes the better decision. I mean, it's kind of easy when you're either deciding between KD or Beal after you get the ball in the middle from the blitz. But I think just trusting him enough to make those decisions is a really big deal for your center because they're not going to stop blitzing Book. They're not going to stop blitzing KD. Like, they're not going to stop doubling. So giving Nurk the confidence to make those type of decisions once he gets the ball at the free throw line, that's a big deal because he usually does kind of make the right choice now let's ignore the free throw line and uh, and Nurkic for a little <laughs> bit because we're going to talk positive here we are going to name Yusuf Nurkic our big bright shining star I'm a big bright shining star 13 points 21 rebounds two assists but two really nice passes and of course he gets a lot of hockey assists as well Yusuf Nurkic does you see him right there with the sunglasses go ahead and drop a like for Yusuf Nurkic back to you Steven do you feel like in order for Nurk to really be able to succeed guys like Katie guys like book even Beal Grace and all of that kind of have to learn a little bit more how to move off the ball and get open and maybe play off of each other outside of the three-point line outside of the paint and give him space to back down throw it out yeah I think that is one of the most important layers of offense in addition to what we talked about with Kevin Durant in the previous topic figuring out how to optimize the usage of use of Nurkic He's not just a screener, though. He's one of the better screeners in the entirety of the NBA. He's not just a handoff hub, though. He's also one of the better front court pieces to operate in that connecting type of manner. You can literally run offense through him, whether he's initiating off of a grab and go, getting into dribble handoffs or getting into five out delay action and initiating dribble handoffs. You could pitch it to him in the post, which we saw him do a little bit in the second half and play the splits. And when he's the person with the ball, Inside the inside the three point line, he has four players spaced out in different variations based off of who's on the floor with them. Those four players are all optimized because all four of those players naturally are either shooting guards, small fours, or power fours, or like hybrid fours like Kevin Durant. Now they're able to play off of cuts. You attract attention differently, and you're inverting the offense. So the angle at which the defense is playing at is completely different than what their game plan is to guard you against, which is pick and roll and things of that nature. So. Getting the most out of Nurkic and optimizing him as well, in addition to the others, with him having the ball in his hands to make playmaking decisions is extremely important. Absolutely important for him. And, and he brings so much. Like you said, he is a great screener. It's not all he brings, but his he's like 300 pounds and he's wide. And you see the difference of a guy like him setting a screen, even somebody like Eubanks. And if you're going to the complete opposite spectrum of the body thickness range, uh, then you have Bull Bull, who doesn't really even set screens. He just kind of stands there and then runs towards the paint or picks and pops. Uh, but but Nurk in imposes that physical presence he bangs down low and he's doing all of this during ramadan so big shout out to him a lot of these games that have been played over on the east coast well it's you know it's it's middle of the day over here it was a four o'clock arizona tip off over there uh it's just about sundown when these games are tipping off so i would assume he's not getting a lot of food in or if he is it's his first food after fasting from sun up to sundown so that is a huge factor for him but aaron I'll I'll go over to the negative side a little bit and appease uh, appease our chat because they do like to 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 nitpick a little bit. But is it nitpicking to worry about Nurk's either foul trouble or his trouble at the foul line? I mean, you're just gonna. Have, I think the foul shooting stuff is gonna figure stuff out. Like they were saying, like his shot looks good. It's not like a hitch. It's not ugly. He has a smooth shot at the free throw line. They're just not falling right now. It's the fouling. Like I got a a lot of Blazers friends, and they're they told me from the start is like those playoff games. Yeah, you got him for uh, Jok uh, Jokic, but Jokic fouls him out a lot. <laughs> and it's going to be just a constant thing that you have to deal with. Like, he's going to be in foul trouble regardless of who we play against. And that's kind of just the part that you're going to have to deal with him. His feet just aren't great enough to run with dudes getting on switches and stuff like that. So he reaches a lot and he takes a lot of chances. And you kind of have to take that if you're going to have the rebounding, too. 
If you're just joining us now, 15 minutes into the show, make sure you hit a thumbs up, subscribe to PHNX Sports. The main crew is going to be back on Sunday. I'm Eric Ruby. That's Aaron Edwards. That's Stephen Prigion. Guys, they are out there. The main crew is. They are celebrating Gerald Bourget's wedding day. It's been months and months in the making. So big shout out to Girth. Big happy congratulations to them. Those guys, Espo's getting it on the dance floor right now. I'm sure he's throwing back a four peaks or two. I know Saul's probably getting it as well. I know he's sneaky good on the dance floor. So just make sure, leave a like while you're here. And if you miss the OG crew, guys, you're going to come back early morning on Sunday and you'll get them. But same question to you, Stephen, are Nurk's free throws and fouls something to be concerned of, especially if you're trying to go deep in the playoffs? The free throws, not as much. I feel like it's just kind of a, uh, just kind of a little bit of a low for him on that end. But the fouls, the fouls was something in addition to his finishing around the basket was something that I was just kind of keeping an eye on in terms of monitoring over the course of the season when they acquired him in the trade over the off season. I feel like, I feel like that is important because he's so important to so much of what they do, not just on the offensive end, but on the defensive end. I know for some viewers, uh, he leaves more to be desired in terms of his activity levels and in terms of how he's just able to operate defensively. But the proof is in the pudding in terms of the stats. They're at some of their best defensively as a team when he's on the floor, on the defensive side of the floor, uh, compared to what they are when he's off the floor. And I think optically and even just watching film, it stands out and it looks the same and matches the stats. So him being available for them and obviously seeing the rebound and discrepancy working against them when he's off the floor versus when he's on, especially in those waning moments, is important. So he has to be available for this team. Honestly, I, I would go as far as to say he's potentially one of the X factors for this team going into the playoffs this season. I mean, I don't think that this team goes deep in the playoffs without Nurk playing his best basketball. And, and you can say that just because you look at who's behind him. Thad <laughs> Young is getting no burn, none at all. And then we have Drew Eubanks, who... Every single person who watches Suns basketball is wondering why he continues to get so many minutes. And the part with, with Eubanks that's interesting is because he'll have a good block. He'll have a good dunk every once in a while. And you'll think to yourself, like, okay, I get why the Suns tampered for him. And even in the <laughs> offseason, you thought to yourself, this would be a really good pickup, just the way that it fits in. But, Steven, you mentioned the numbers when Nurk's on the court with those starters, that best five-man unit for Phoenix. If you just take him off, and you put Drew Eubanks in there and you sub it in, it's basically the other end of the spectrum. It goes from extremely high net rating, extremely high defensive rating, offensive rating, all of that, to completely opposite on the other end. And, and I do think that's in part to Drew Eubanks and his inability to find a rhythm on the floor. But it's also because Yusuf Nurkic just does so much. And yeah, he has his flaws. And at the beginning of the season, I'll be honest, my expectations for him were a lot lower than how he's been playing. Like he has easily exceeded what I thought he could do. And I remember James Jones in the press conference after the DA trade, and they were talking about fit. And like Yusuf Nurkic is a better fit for this team than they were basically saying DeAndre Ayton. And the way that he plays, you're going to see it. And a lot of people were really really doubting that I don't think that there is another center that would I would say on the same pay scale and p play like look Nicole Jokic would be a better fit with these guys right but as far as like pay and ability and like resources go for this team to get Aaron do you feel like Yusuf Nurkic is the best option that they could have at center yeah, even like kind of before, I'm, we were talking about way worse centers before we got Nurk. <laughs> when we were talking about getting rid of Aiden, we were talking about uh, Miles Turner and stuff like that. Like, I think we still ended up on top of this center wise, regardless of how people felt earlier, because I was his finishing around the rim was really bad to start the season. His yeah. feet were slow on defense. Anthony Davis was absolutely cooking him at the beginning. Like we like the problems that we knew he had were pretty like noticeable to start the season, but you can tell he's been actually working. He's aggressive. He's been dunking the ball, like in a really physical manner, like this last couple months. So you can see like, he hears the criticism and he knows the stuff that he's terrible at. And I think this was like the best case scenario to get after Aiton. And he's also like a really good teammate. I, I feel like I, probably right now, because I'm not able to check Twitter like I usually do when I'm producing and see if anything else is going on. I, I, I'm i sure that Yusuf Nurkic has probably tweeted something funny, yet <laughs> insightful and supportive of his teammates, <laughs> because that's just kind of what he does. And Steven, I know you're a really big X's and O's guys. I, I know that you like to look at the way people play together, look at the numbers, look at the sets, look at the actions and all of that. But from a guy who looks at the game in your way, how important is it that off the court, you have somebody like Yusuf Nurkic, who is is just oh i mean plain and simple just a really good chemistry guy 
Yeah, those those things are equally as important as the fit in terms of the context of the team and how those puzzle pieces fit together to ultimately make, you know, this team what it what it's gonna be at the end of the season, whenever their season ends. Those things are important. You know, we, we talked about the leadership bit and how some of the national pundits have made that like a hot word in relation to the Suns. I mean, those things that you see Yusuf Nurkic doing both on the floor and off the floor and on Twitter for the public eye, but also behind closed doors, those are very much bits of leadership. It might not necessarily come from the people, from the persons on the team that outside external people expect it to come to, and it might not come in the manner in which other people expect for it to come to or would like for it to to come to the team, but Nurkic very much brings all of that in addition to all of the skills that we see every on the floor. Okay, let's keep the Nurk love fest going here, guys. I, I I am loving it because I do feel like sometimes a player like that will have a couple bad parts to their game, and that's what solely gets focused on. And, and I want Be More Funny to kind of show his voice here. He says, I feel like we could win a series without one of the big two, but he doesn't think that they could win without Nurk. Simple agree or disagree, Aaron? Um, we've seen, it depends on who's missing out of the big two, honestly, but I can see us winning a series without one of them with Nurk in it. I think see, getting, giving Eubanks 35 minutes in a game is just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so I think if you try to switch those minutes out for Nurk's minutes and just have Eubanks out there with anybody, I think that's just a nightmare waiting to happen. So I kind of agree. It just depends on who out of the big two. Steven, what do you think? I, I tend to agree with that. I think, like Aaron said, it depends on which of the big three is missing from that from that mix. But I do think that with Nurkic in there versus with him out, like we talked about with the number discrepancy, is you just can't replace what he does. You can somewhat replace what one of the big three does by having one of the other two step up, but you can't replace what Nurkic brings with anything that you have on the roster right now. All right, guys, we're going to keep the fun going. Just a reminder, it's Eric Ruby right here in the middle. I got my boy Stephen Prigion rocking the Dreamville beanie. And then with the dope Diamondbacks jersey right over there, that's Aaron Edwards. Guys, I mentioned it earlier. They are off. The main crew is at Gerald Borgay's wedding. And I know for an absolute fact, guys, that Four Peaks is being served at that wedding. And it is being served uh, rather graciously, <laughs> I would say. And Four Peaks, it, Four Peaks is the official beer of PHNX. We have a lot of really cool stuff in the works with them my personal favorite i love the wow wheat uh, i'm a lighter beer kind of guy when when i first started drinking beer i tried to tell myself i was a darker beer kind of guy uh and then i i came to my senses for me personally but if you like a darker beer they have the kilt lifter they have a sun's brew specifically a cardinals one as well and a diamondbacks one um plus they have a great pub over there in tempe they have food it's a rotating menu all the time and uh they also have a collab with bad birdie it's the uh bad birdie juicy golden ale more of the type of beer Beer that I like. Espo always likes to say they're super drinkable, which most beers should be, but I will go out there and I will say this Four Peaks is the most drinkable beer out there. You can visit fourpeaks.com slash locator to find all your favorite beers and events or check out at Four Peaks Brew or Four Peaks Pub to keep up with the latest at Arizona's hometown brewery. Guys, uh, as always, when it comes to alcohol, you must be 21 years or over to enjoy. But speaking of enjoy, there's a brand new, uh, promotion over at Arizona Lottery that I'm actually loving. I love the outdoors, guys. I love to go out there and touch grass, as some of the people say. And Arizona Lottery is combining making money, touching green, with going outside, touching grass. And you can do that in a couple different ways. Way number one is you can buy a regular scratcher featuring one of three iconic Arizona landscapes, and you can win up to $50,000 with that. Cool. You can just do that, end of your day, throw your scratcher out after you win. Perfect. Or you can go to a geolocated hike or landscape and you can check in on their website azadventure.com and you can get entered for a chance to win one million dollars in cash and travel prizes and the best thing is it's actually a win-win-win because every ticket that you buy part of the proceeds is going going towards conserving the environment in arizona and other fantastic projects around here so make sure you check out arizona lottery win yourself some money go outside before it's 195 degrees outside because we all know that's going to be happening sooner rather than later and visit azadventure.com to figure out where those geolocated events are that you can check in at and go have some fun guys besides yusuf nurkic let's open up the floor here who else stood out for you we'll go to you steven as far as good play for the suns tonight and and we'll maybe get into some more disappointing performances later. Yeah, for me, it's also uh, Grayson Allen. Uh, we talked a little bit about him pregame. We talked about how his three-point shooting still is the plot in terms of people assessing his season. 
but it's he's so much more than just a three point shooter. We saw him used in some movement actions today, and how his how important his drives continue to be for this team because naturally, if he has the ball, not unlike when Nurkic has it, that means that the big three are all spaced around him. How many teams are going to be comfortable conceding help from one of those from one of those three to stop a Grayson Allen drive? In addition to that, Grayson Allen has uh, plenty of ability and self creation off the dribble to get past his initial defender. That puts the defense in compromise. He gets early offense paint touches, and then when the Suns are able to play off of multiple drives and get an early offense paint touch, they are arguably the best offense in the NBA. Now it looks different than other teams go about it with movement and action and things like that, but it's equally effective because there's so much complexity within the simplicity of their offense just off of the personnel. So Grayson Allen for me, in addition to the defense that he brings, he's just so on time and on schedule with everything he does and just a, such an important uh, piece of everything they do. Did you say complexity and the simplicity? You need to go to Dreamville. That's a bar. Oh, my God. That was incredible. No, I'm sorry. I got to stop for a second and be like, whew, that was hot. Okay, Aaron, I asked you in our pregame show, which if you missed it, we had a good time. You could check that out as well. I asked you if you were a bowl lever from the beginning when they signed in this offseason. I also want to go over to Grayson Allen because Grayson Allen is somebody who's brought so many different parts to the game that, that to be honest, I wasn't expecting uh, I, I was obviously expecting the shooting. I knew he was going to shoot. I knew he was going to play hard. Um, but his defense, his passing, hell, he had 14 assists one game. Like, his just ability to be a really smart player and above all else, drive to the rim when it is smart to drive to the rim has caught me off guard. Like, I wasn't expecting all of this at the beginning. Are, are you in the same boat as me? Um, I watched a lot of college basketball when he was at Duke. Okay. And it was like one of those things where I knew what he could do. Like no other team was going to ask him to do what he had to do here. And I would just wanted to know if he still had it in him. Like I had seen, like he, we knew he could get buckets. We knew he had bounce. We knew he can get to the rim, but he hadn't been asked to do that in a lot of years. <laughs> and we kind of knew that the way the floor was going to be spread, that they might ask Grayson to do that. And I, I, I won't say that I thought that he could do this, but I wanted to know if he could, like flip that switch again and get back to being the Grayson Allen that probably was the man at his high school, the man at his college and see if he can actually go back to playing the way that he probably knows that he could probably do for a lot of teams, but he just never was asked. He was playing with Giannis is get in the corner and make shots. And he did that. Now he gets to do a lot more on a team with a lot of space and he can get to the rim and run and make decisions that he hadn't been able to make in a really long time. And it's a team that always needs him to do it now at this point because they don't always need his three-point shooting. I mean, listen, when you go and you hit like eight straight threes in the first half, like definitely that helps. That can open a lot of things up. But he just makes the right play. And a lot of times with the Suns, especially in their half-court offense, the ball is either like, whipping around like they're the 2014 Spurs or it's just one person has the ball, they're dribbling and it's an ISO and it's a pull-up shot. And usually it doesn't feel like a lot of in-between unless Grayson Allen touches the ball. And when Grayson Allen touches the ball, it's a lot of drive, kick, relocate, like everywhere that he is, it's smart. And to your point, like, yeah, he did that in college. He did that in Duke. But a lot of guys are the man in college, but then they have to be built around a specific skill set in the NBA and they find their role. And Grayson did. He started for one of the best teams, if not the best team in basketball with the Bucks that year. But at the same time now, you come to Phoenix and Phoenix completely opens everything up for you. And you could still argue that he could use some more responsibility, a bigger role. And somebody who was asking for a bigger role through the media at the beginning <laughs> of the season was Eric Gordon, who came back tonight after missing a couple of games. And he was one of the main reasons why the Suns were actually able to lead at halftime, I'm wondering, I'm wondering your guys' thoughts overall on Eric Gordon, just Eric Gordon's game, how it fits with this team, and then specifically when it comes down tonight. Aaron, I'll throw it back to you. Let's start with tonight. What did you like from EG? Uh, my biggest thing, it's not even the shot making. Like, we know that's what he got here for. He wasn't ball watching on defense, and he gets caught doing that a lot for the most part and giving up cuts and just sort of just having slow feet and not taking the defensive side of the ball serious. And today, he didn't get caught just looking and ball watching and dudes getting the jump on him. And so that was probably the thing I liked the most today from him. He wasn't a minus on defense and just giving up open stuff. Steven, is that the same thing that you took away from EG's game? Yeah, and I think that that part is important because Eric has the ability to strength-wise guard up a couple of positions uh, than what his his height suggests just because he's he has a low center of gravity and he's a stronger you know, type of guard, especially later on in his career. So being able to play in a post outside of versatility, again, like Aaron said, when he's paying attention 
on the defensive side of the floor and not falling asleep off ball to have an impact. And that obviously if he could be even even just neutral on defense, the positivity that he brings when he's knocking down multiple three-pointers and getting into his cuts and getting into his drives on offense just makes him a positive piece for this team and gives them that much-needed punch that they often desire in that reserve realm of the roster. Yeah, and, and it's tough because EG definitely is in the hotter cold range now at this point in his career. I mean, he's averaging about 12 points per game. Um, but it's usually a 20 point performance and a six point performance and 20 point performance and a six point performance. And, and that is tough because when you look at all the minimum guys that the sun signed over the off season and the ones that remain, which is not that many, he was, he was the guy that everybody was like, that's the piece, right? That's the guy that you got for lower than what he probably could have signed and expected value. And it's, it's been an up and down ride. And, and look, I will admit it. There have been lots of times that I've screamed at my TV to get Eric Gordon off the court. But uh, tonight, except for, I think one point was not one of them. And that was at the very beginning of the game. And yes, this could have gone to Grayson Allen, but we wanted to uh, show some respect for EG and respecting our elders, even though Grayson has gray hair. And that is why <laughs> Eric Gordon is our PHNX factor of the Let's night. Go, give it to you. That's right. He's going to give it to you. Big shout out to Eric Gordon guys. Was there anybody else in this game that you were, were considering as like you know that that supplemental star that x factor that kind of changed some things around and you can include the big three since we are not giving any of these uh very prestigious usual awards uh steven i'll throw it back to you yeah sorry microphone was off yeah for me i think it's bradley bill bradley bill is continuing to everything downhill and everything at a specific cadence that is a contrast to the tempo of play that Kevin Durant and Devin Booker operate at. And I think there's just so much value in Bradley Bill's presence, whether he's efficient in his scoring or not. Like we saw in the game against Oklahoma City from a couple a week or a week, a little bit over a week ago now. He didn't score efficiently, but because he was just so downhill with everything, beating his man off the dribble every single time he touched it, there's just so much value in that. That gets a reaction out of the defense. And again, like we talked about, when the Suns have a defense in rotation, that's when they're at their best. They can, they can do that pretty much whenever they want to. They just have to decide to do it with consistency. And Bradley Bill performing in the space that he's operating in over the last week or so is important for them going forward. Aaron, we watched the game together, and a lot of the times Beal was driving to the rim, just like, oh, yeah, nice take, nice take, a nice take. I, I, I personally, like, I think everybody who watches the Suns, who breaks down the Suns, knows that Beal's ability to get his head down and get to the rim – opens up a lot but it's still a nice change of pace when you're watching the game like it still stands out a lot does it not yeah i mean even like the year we went to the finals and the year that we had like the best record in the league like we didn't have constant rim pressure like that we were still a mid-range team and it's good when things when you have lulls on offense and you're struggling you have a guy that can really put pressure on the rim and you would hope gets to the line. I mean, I don't think he got to the line that much today, but he he's always putting pressure on you and he's always trying to get you, make you scramble by getting to the rim or get fouled or just constantly just pressuring you to get to the rim and starting the offense that way. So I think that Bill is always going to come through because when you're having lows, he's going to try to get downhill regardless and he's trying to make you make a call. Yeah, he's definitely the the most aggressive at getting to the paint. Book book gets in that mode a lot of the times, especially when he gets a little bit upset, a little peeved off, but he'll still stay a little bit in that mid-range game more than Beal. But I want to talk about the the big three because it was a really weird game from them. All all of them, honestly. Beal was the most consistent, but Book did not score until about a couple minutes before halftime. He ended up actually being the leading scorer at 21 points. Kevin Durant didn't technically take a shot. He took one and got fouled. Didn't technically take a shot until the beginning of the second quarter. So I'll, I'll throw it kind of to you guys. You can start either on Booker or Durant. But Aaron, I'm just gonna I'm gonna pass it right back. We're doing a little give and go right now. What what was it about today's game that you think was just a little bit off from one of those guys? It seemed like they were all waiting for the other one to take over in the first quarter. Like I said before the game, I thought Book was gonna come out and be aggressive and just be the one to take over, but. Then KD was kind of taking a while and they were kind of just like trying to see who was going to do it. And Bill was the only one that was like, all right, I'll do this. Like I'll put pressure on the rim. I'll run the offense. I'll do all that stuff. And I think that was probably like my biggest issue was usually they find a pretty good balance early book loves first quarters. That's why he plays the entire first quarter. Most of the time 
But it seemed like they were all just waiting for the other person to take over. And that was probably the weird thing, especially coming off a tough, uh, uh, such a tough L yesterday. I mean, yeah. And like you said, they're coming off a tough L. They're coming off a back to back. So maybe you would expect energy to be a little bit lower. But I, I don't know if we've gotten through an entire first quarter where Kevin Durant does not have a field goal attempted on, on the stat sheet. And like, yeah, he got he got fouled. But at the same time, like this is this is Kevin Durant here. Like Kevin Durant should be coming out and. If it's not on Kevin Durant to go out and to get his shots right away, it's on the other guys, right? Like I remember, I think it was way back in one of the earlier Lakers game, maybe even one of the IST games or something like that, where KD reportedly went up to book before the game and was like, stop looking for me. Yeah. Stop looking for me. Go, go be a killer, right? And then book went out and he was a killer. And I understand that mindset and I think – the reason why guys like Kevin Durant and Devin Booker get along so well is because they both want to dominate, but they don't want to step on the game. And I think they were both trying not to step on the game. And then they were both out of their flows, though. And, and I think at that point, you need at least one of them, right? Like if it's not going to be Beal, who a lot of people say, you know, he should be the point guard. If it's Book, which I believe he should be the primary ball handler. I know that Beal gets a lot of rim pressure, but as a facilitator, I like Devin Booker more. I need you to go out of your way if Kevin Durant does not have a shot and we're just about there's about four or three minutes left in the first quarter. Now you go up to him and you say, it's your time to be a killer. Like you are trying to play and blend into this game too much. And, and that's not like a bad thing for Kevin Durant because usually some of the great scores, the guys who could put up a bunch of shots in a game or hit a lot of shots in a game aren't the ones that can blend in and, and be comfortable taking a back seat. And, yeah. and that could be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. And tonight, it was a bad thing. And, and I'm just hoping that one of them can kind of go out of the way and just say, step that up. Like, just, we need you right here, right now. And maybe it's Bradley Beal, because Steven, we've seen Bradley Beal, especially when he first came out, be the most outwardly vocal one of them in the media. So maybe it's on him to, to go out there and get these other guys set up. I don't know. It's kind of like a catch-22, who does what. Yeah, I like I like when it's Brad that's setting the tone, which we saw prior to Booker coming back. Naturally, I put Bill in a position of initiating offense more and just his general usage going up. I think the tones when they when they set it a little different by getting Bill downhill, that's forcing teams to start the game off in rotation. Typically, teams are able to start with keeping their defensive shell intact. So if you're automatically starting the game and you're five five seconds in and you're already in rotation. And now it's Kevin Durant, Grayson Allen. Uh, if it's Eric Gordon that's starting, if it's if it's obviously Devin Booker on the floor, those guys are getting open looks early. And whether they're shooting those or they're playing to keep the advantage with a drive and of a closeout from there, that's just naturally putting them in a position to dictate to their opponents with the offensive side of things. And I think it just hits different when they start games that way. And, I mean, outside of the open in possession where they went to their flex action and I think Nurkic hit Bill for a layup to start the game, Outside of that, the movement was a little bit of stagnant and just the general flow was stagnant because they weren't connected. And I think that's just kind of a little bit of uh, what stemmed from that. I think we saw it in the Boston game, honestly. There was a lot of Bradley Bill rim pressure, paint pressure, getting up attempts, driving kicks, multiple driving kicks in one possession. That was missing early in the game in this one. And, you know, they didn't really dictate the way that they, I guess, have grown accustomed to. I think it's it's pretty easy to say that that Bradley Beal most nights he he won't be the best player on the Suns. Now he has the ability to he has the ability to step up and drop fifty on any given night, but it just doesn't seem like in his role he's going to be the guy you're going in day in day out. Be like that's our best player. But Aaron, do you feel like he's maybe the most important cog to that offense working, getting somebody downhill, getting somebody inside, so that everything else can open up, so that those guys like Book and Durant can can play more open and play more free. Yeah, I mean, we've seen it firsthand, like when shots aren't falling, especially from the older sons, when we had CP, like he wasn't at the stage where he's going to get layups and drive by you and do that. And Mikel wasn't ready to do that. He wasn't part of like in his career like that yet. And we know Book just wants to get in the middle and then kind of just roam and see when to make a decision and shoot the fadeaway. Like, I think having a guy that's constantly getting downhill fast and putting pressure on your bigs like that's really important later and having him be the only really the only person that's gonna do that that's gonna come in handy later yeah and i i do think that when you're playing basketball and i know both of you play basketball and both of you play football too i know steven's a flag football legend over there i see <laughs> I, I see the tweets steven i see the tweets um but when you play basketball with somebody 
sometimes you kind of like play off of what your teammates are doing, right? Like if somebody comes out there and they're chucking up a lot of threes and you're shooting a lot of jump shots, like you might look at that and say like, I'm going to play more into that. Or you might go the complete opposite and say, I need to fill a different role. I feel like when you see a guy like Brad go out there and just say, I am going to take probably the most difficult layups on this team. I'm going to drive. I'm going to slither in traffic. I'm going to go underneath. And he misses a, a decent amount of them because he takes some really tough shots. But when you see him do that, it feels like it kind of sets the tone. And, and I really love that from him. Any any other guys like X Factors? You want to talk about Bull Bull? You don't want to talk about little Bull Bull? Because he had a, not, not the greatest Bull Bull game tonight. Uh, only uh, eight points for him, one for five, sorry, eight minutes, one of five for the field, only three points for uh, for Bull Bull. But it didn't feel like he really got to play through uh, a, a lot of his problems. And we were talking about that pregame, Steven, that you kind of just need to like let him cook a little bit, even when he's not cooking, because you you want to see what he can do even when he hits a little bit of adversity. Yeah, I I struggle, though I do understand, you know, why why Frank features him the way that he does. Because you can't just, you know, throw a ball in whatever lineup and it works the way you can with like a Kevin Durant type player. He has to be insulated in a certain way for him to be effective, especially depending on, you know, who your opponent is. Um, I just feel like he's still in that space where he's trying to earn the trust of Frank Vogel. And there's like a, there's a spotlight on him for sure. And I like that even regardless of a night like tonight, that he's not out there playing with hesitation. He's playing still free, which is where he's obviously optimized. When he's not putting a box and he's able to just be bold and be just kind of just a random chaos creator on offense and defense, that's when he's at his best. So I think these games like this one, obviously they're going to desire to see more from him, but they're important in process and figuring out how to feature him going forward and what against what matchups he might work better in versus the ones that he might not work as well in. So I think I it's think, just kind of back and forth there with that. Yeah, like with with Bull, right? Like I get it. The, he wasn't great this game. Usually, when you've seen him plugged in, and he's playing with with a Nurk or with the KD, uh, and and definitely with one of the the big three and the big two guards out there as well. So he's never just out there and it's Bull Bull time, right? Like we're just gonna go through and Bull Bull is gonna dribble it up the court like he did in Orlando and take a step back three like he did in <laughs> like that. That's not happening, right? But in a game like this where everything is so ugly. Like like the offense was 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 ugly tonight. Like it had good moments, but overall, I mean, shooting percentage wise, like there was some pretty ugly bricks here, man. Like we we were watching and Grace and Allen missed the entire rim. Eric Gordon had the loudest brick I think I've ever heard in my entire life. And they had good games, but there were, those were still happening, right? I feel like this is the time the Charlotte Hornets on Friday, March 15th you need to let Bull Bull play through this type of stuff. And I'm not just sitting there going and saying that because I think he's a fun commodity and he he deserves 30 minutes a game and should be in the Sun starting lineup. But if you don't look at Bull Bull right now and think this is a guy that can swing five minutes in a playoff series for us, then, then you haven't been watching Suns basketball, or at least you haven't been watching it right because at his best, at his peak, he can swing that. But today, that, that wasn't the case. But he got the plug pulled. I think he played five minutes in the first half, three minutes in the second half, and he just didn't get a chance to go out there and get a rhythm. And, and that's, really, that's really big for basketball players. Aaron, I know you play basketball every <laughs> single week. Like Sometimes you get out there in the first five to ten minutes that you're hooping, you're like, I'm not really feeling this, that you work up a sweat, you get a little bit out of breath, and you start just to have it come more naturally. I feel like they need to do that with bowl. Do you agree? Uh, you kind of, like I said earlier, like you kind of have to – keep a short leash like you got to let them kind of figure it out but you kind of have to keep the short leash too in october november december yeah you could have done this those are the easy games like but to be trying out the bowl bowl experiment as good as it has been how, how fun as as it has been how confident he looks now i think trying that now when you're in the play-in technically and you're trying to get out of it you can't really test out the bowl bowl situation as much as you probably want it to early on it's kind of just too late and you got to start figuring out how the big three can click before even trying to make Bo bowl click but they didn't they didn't try it earlier right and like you're <laughs> right I, listen in a perfect world <laughs> i would have loved for them to initially implement him but maybe the reason why he's come in and be, been able to have an impact is because they just took him aside and said we're gonna work on you we're gonna coach you we're not just gonna throw you in a game and let you go out there and, and you know burn everything to the ground like we're going to work on everything with you and then we're gonna slowly integrate you and we got to the point where, where he was playing close to 20 minutes in a game, yeah. <laughs> right? 
And, and so to me, it's it's not just this is the bowl bowl experiment now. Like I think you've seen enough to know that he can be a positive player for you. And with Eubanks playing the way that he is, with Thad Young getting absolutely no minutes, you traded away all your other big forwards. Like th- there is room for him to be a backup here for Kevin Durant. There's room for here to, for him to play with Kevin Durant. You can fit him into a lot of different lineups. I don't like him playing with Eubanks, but he can. I'd prefer Nurk, Bull, KD, and I think there were some people in the uh, in, in the chat who are asking for that lineup as well. So I, I don't know if I'm sitting here saying it's the Bull Bull experiment. Like I get it, you have you haven't been able to see enough of him yet, but from what I have seen, like he is he has shown that that he can play and, and he can hoop. So like if you have to put on you know your your genie hat. Steven, look at your crystal ball and say it's it's let's say the Suns make it out of the plane or they're not in the plane in the first place, whatever. And they're playing a first round matchup in the West. You're going to be playing somebody tough. Eight, nine, ten minutes into the game. Are you looking down and expecting Bull Bull to check in for the Phoenix Suns? Yeah, I I actually wrote about Bull uh, maybe about five or six weeks ago over at Bright Side of the Sun and just kind of assessing at that moment in time the impact that he had, which had them performing with him on the floor as the best defense in the league in defensive rating. There's just for a team like I talked about in pregame that has uh, a size issue in terms of how many guards are featured in their main rotation to have a piece that can go out and contest shots and just be affect the, 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 the offensive decision-making of opponents when he's on the floor with his length, with his athleticism, with his chaos inducing activity. In addition to when he's featured on the floor with Kevin Durant, in addition to when he's also featured with Yusuf Nurkic protecting the basket, that allows for him to play with that kind of randomness defensively that is impactful. And when this team is up in the act, the activity levels defensively, and then they're playing out in transition, that's some of the best that that this team can kind of uh, weed through their offensive process. And I think Bowl really puts them in those positions just off of what he does is his baseline. We're not even talking about him doing anything exceptional in terms of the box score. Just him being a presence out there on defense has so much value for this team. And I think, again, when he's featured the right way with Nurkic and with Kevin Durant, you're able to kind of see and reap the benefits of doing so in the manners in which he can be featured. I think it's pretty clear that uh, Bull Bull is still earning some trust from his coaching staff. And and I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, Bull Bull is not in Frank Vogel's inner circle, but gentlemen, I have some great news for you. You are both a part of my inner circle because this has been absolutely fantastic chat. All of you guys are part of my inner circle as well. Thank you for tapping in, having some fun with us on this Friday night. Once again, your regular crew will be back on Sunday. So don't, you know, (laughs) hyperventilate too much. (laughs) Like they're going to be back y'all, but we're just having a little bit of fun. And and I can tell you, man, since before I worked here, since before I was producing for PH next sons, I was a circle K man through and through. And then they decided to go out there and drop the best membership in the game. And that's the circle K inner circle. Now, Steven, I know you don't live locally, but if you are ever out here, sign up for the inner circle. Cause if you're driving, you can get 25 cents off your first five Phillips and man gas is expensive but guess what it's not just 25 cents off your first five phillips it's three cents up to five cents when you do it a lot off of every single time that you buy gas per gallon and if you don't drive let's say you ride a scooter or something right and you just need a snack because you're scootering real hard you can still go to circle k you can go to circle k and if you're part of the inner circle you can get every six free on a selection of circle k products that's pizza coffee ice cold fountain drinks basically every single time i'm driving to the office i'm texting some people here hey you need anything from circle k do you need me to stop at circle k because there's two Two on my 10-minute drive in here. <laughs> They're that convenient, guys. Join Circle K's Inner Circle right now by down, by downloading the Circle K app today. Some terms and conditions do apply at participating locations. Visit CircleK.com for more details. And guys, I mentioned it at the top of the show. It is a flavor in Friday, and we are a different flavor for the PHNX Suns podcast, but the best flavor that you can get is with our friends over at OGs. Much like I was a fan of Circle K before I got here over to PHNX, I was also a fan of OGs because guess what? Not only are they the best cannabis-infused scratch-made gummies that you can find in State 48, 
They're just really good tasting gummies. Like there could be absolutely nothing that you get out of it. Like no THC, no CBD, which they do have those combinations. It's really nice. They could just be candy and I would buy OGs. That's how good they are, guys. OGs has a couple new products that you could be checking out right now made with live rosin. That's the RSO Rick Simpson oil. That's the OGs Naturals. Uh, we mentioned Chris Paul earlier doesn't like to get to the rim, but he does like to keep it vegan so he can have some vegan OGs with the OGs Naturals. And then the big OGs, which is 100 milligram gummy, but it's perforated in 10 slices if you still want to break it up. They got freshly squeezed ju juice in there as well. Like it's, it's truly just a good product. Like just beyond the fact that it makes you feel good. It's just a good product. It's well done. It's well branded. It's well packaged. Everything like that. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to find because they're always selling out when they restock. But to learn more about OG's gummies and where you can find them, head on over to ogsbrands.com. Much like some other stuff we talked about, guys, you must be 21 and over to participate. But once you hit 21, you definitely want to check out OG's. All right, guys, uh, let's keep it moving a little bit. I want to talk about the NBA as a whole. Because you're two guys that know ball. You're ball knowers over here. You like to talk hoop. Like, I, I could tell. I follow you on Twitter. I know you guys. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but the NBA and the style of play has shifted a little bit post All-Star break. And we did get this tweet from Adrian Wojnarowski uh, before the Suns played a game today saying the NBA is telling teams in the league office did not deliver a directive to reduce scoring in Tuesday's competition committee call, but quote, this trend will continue to be monitored, end quote, according to a memo obtained by ESPN. Quote, slower pace, style of play, competitive intensity, officiating focus have been contributing factors identified so far all right i need you guys to break out your bullshit meters and uh aaron i'll start with you is uh is this bullshit did, I, i'm pretty sure adam silver made the call man i my favorite thing about the internet is the lies i say this all the time i love when the commissioner has to come out and lie straight to our face so yeah i'm, I'm calling bullshit on this and it's just so noticeable they're not calling they're it's not just the fouls they're calling less defensive three seconds too like they they're swallowing the whistles and we kind of have all been asking them to do it. So I wouldn't say it's as a complaint. It's just as long as it's both ways, I'm down with the ball being like this. It's a faster pace. They're running now. And like, yes, the pace is slowing down a little bit, but I think all the calls were just getting way too frustrating and destroying the game. And so, yeah, if it means some of these aren't going to get called, then I'll take it. Steven, I imagine that you just spend your uh, free time with your eyes peeled open and just NBA league pass just rolling over the TV nonstop. But before this, before it kind of became a storyline the last couple of games, did, did you notice this kind of uh, trend happening? Yeah, you could definitely feel it in just, just watching the league as a whole. And honestly, I feel like post-All-Star break, the, the officiating, it kind of deviates from what we saw prior to it. And it starts to gather more of a playoff style feel. Now, obviously, this season is a lot more dramatic, and hence we're sitting here having this conversation on this wonderful platform that we have to talk in the microphones with. But I do think that this is a commonality in terms of things kind of um, being more inclined towards a playoff style in terms of, like I said, officiating style of play, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just lending itself to that, which is obviously on the grander scheme in terms of. Uh, how uh, extreme it is. Aaron, do you feel like this style of play is beneficial or detrimental to how the Suns uh, play basketball? I mean, as Suns fans, you can ask them, do we get calls anyway? Like, what are we talking about? Dude, the <laughs> amount of shoulders that were thrown <laughs> into people in this game, like, I get it, play more physical, all of that. But don't call a foul on Bradley Beal when the man got speared like yeah. Edge in like mid 2000s WWE and falls to the ground and they call a foul on Bradley Beal. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Like, I don't, I don't get that. But you are right. Like, as longtime Phoenix Suns fans, like we can attest that like even our guy Book, like back when back in the days when Book was busting and ass for a team that that won 20 games, the man would not get superstar calls at all. And, and a lot of people uh, pondered uh, that was because the owner was especially cheap and maybe didn't donate <laughs> to the ref's Christmas bonuses. Um, but but you are right. Like, were the Suns getting calls anyway? But e even beyond that, with the way that Suns play, where they, they don't drive to the rim a ton, they have a lot of superstars that are built around the perimeter, the mid-range, the three-point line, and ball movement and stuff like that. Steven, 
Is that better or worse when it comes to a physical style of play, almost not avoiding the inside? Because like we mentioned, Dirk and, and Beal and Grayson will drive, but having your main offensive engine be outside of the paint. Yeah, I think the I think just the way the officiating has been, it lends itself to the Suns' favor um, in a few contexts. I think the first one being, obviously, we talked about Nurkic getting a lot of fouls called on him. I think if their whistle was as quick as it was in early portions of the season, Nurkic probably would have fouled out in a couple more games than he's already flirted with in his post-All-Star break stretch, for one. In addition to that, the Suns have, I mean, they've been one of the teams that generate the most free throw attempts a game. So naturally, the whistle kind of being taken away, it kind of goes against that a little bit, but there's only they're only going to allow for so much of that to occur, even in a playoff context. They're not going to allow for it to, like, lose control of the game in terms of it turning into more of a football game or slam ball, if you will, than basketball. So I do think those things kind of contrast in a little bit, but I do think ultimately it'll be to their favor if it just allows for them to keep Nurkic on the floor. You can adjust to that more than the latter, in my opinion. Well, I, I think bringing up Nurk again is a really good point because – when Nurk doesn't play, the Suns don't win. Like that, that's not an opinion. That's a fact. When, when Yusuf Nurkic does not play, the Suns do not win basketball games. And in a microcosm, when he's not on the court, a lot of the times they're not winning those minutes. And if you, again, like, like I said, I think in pregame, and I said it in postgame, if you just switch Yusuf Nurkic and Drew Eubanks with the big three and Grayson Allen out there on the court, the net rating is drastically different. Like Yusuf Nurkic makes a massive difference. And what I'm worried about is like, yes, Maybe you can get a little bit more physical style of play, but it does still feel like Nurkic is not getting that benefit of the doubt that, that maybe some guys and some big guys do. It feels like he's getting clobbered on one end and there's not really any fouls. And then on the other end, it's not ticky tack, but they're, they're still having a little bit of a tighter whistle. And I would be concerned if five minutes, six minutes into a, a playoff game, Nurk picks up his second or third foul, and now you're starting to struggle and wonder, is it going to be Drew Eubanks? Is Thad Young going to come out of pseudo-retirement on the Suns bench? <laughs> is it going to be Bull Bull? Like, you're really sitting here wondering, and that's why, with all of this, like, I'm curious, where the hell is Thad Young? Like, I don't know if I'm tripping. I don't know if my expectations were wrong, but when they signed Thad Young, it felt a little bit like an Eric Gordon signing, maybe to a lower level, but a really solid veteran who's going to have a reduced role and could maybe be able to thrive on that role on a team that generates so much other attention in other ways. And besides that Rockets game, like we really have not seen him out there. And Steven, do you feel like he still has gas left in the tank? Like obviously at this point, if they're not incorporating him, he's probably not going to be a part of the playoff rotation, but could he at least eat some minutes, you know, during Ramadan for Nurk while he's fasting? <laughs> yeah, that latter point is very relevant. Uh, I do think that I think that uh, Thad Young does have a role for this team, especially in the playoff context. It might not necessarily show, or it might not necessarily be used in the regular season. But I think the template for for Thaddeus Young, uh, you know what you're getting from him, and you know what he can unlock for your team, which is obviously a bridging of the gap between. Yusuf Nurkic being off the floor and the Suns not necessarily going directly to a small ball with Kevin Durant at the five. You're able to bridge that gap and put Thaddeus Young, still get elements of playing with the quote-unquote traditional center in terms of not being entirely too small in the front court, but also getting the versatility that allows for the, the small ball lineups to obviously be a curveball, a change of pace to everything that you do with your process lineup-wise. So him unlocking switching, him unlocking being able to play on the short roll uh, and being able to play a little bit closer to five-out spacing that Nurkic provides, those little things kind of add up. And I think there's going to be games where down the stretch they're going to call for Thaddeus Young's impact to be felt from this team. I do think that Frank Vogel will feature him a, a few more times down this home stretch of the regular season, but I do think that the majority of his value is going to be felt more so on the playoff stage when it's more so like grown man ball and you being able to counter and adjust and all of those things on the fly. In a vacuum, I, I agree with you. And I, I would say, yeah, he, he should be the type of guy that you can break in case of emergency, play him five, maybe 10 minutes at worst in a playoff game. But Aaron, he's not, he's not getting any playing time right now, even against the Charlotte Hornets. Like, can you, can you go into the playoffs? Like, sure. We're talking about bull bull here. At least bull bulls getting some freaking minutes. Like that young's getting none. Can, can you rely on him? Just say, you know what? We're saving you for the playoffs. We didn't really incorporate you at all. Now come out here and play on the biggest stage. Like, are you comfortable doing that? <laughs> 
I think it's really one of those breaking ca- uh, in case of emergency things. It's like, um, I think he's trying to figure out the eight that he's going to go with. I can see him having a really short leash with a lot of these dudes, even Bo Bo. Like, I think he's going to go with the uh, Mike Malone uh uh, level of coaching and just get his eight or seven and a half yeah, <laughs> and just stick with them throughout the playoffs. And I think there's really no wiggle room when it comes to Frank. I really just think he's trying to figure out who's getting all these minutes. Cause I think once the playoffs start, dudes are going to be playing some high minutes because oh, he's yeah. big time on trust. And it doesn't seem like he trusts that many of the guys at the end of the bench. Well, I mean, it's also a product of having uh, your top three guys make the amount of money that they make. <laughs> right. And, and Yusuf Nurkic and Grayson Allen have been incredible. We've talked about them a, a very large portion of the show. I'd say we've actually talked about the big three the least. But, you know, when you have superstars getting paid that much and, and you have end of rotation guys like you're not going to have a bountiful pickings at the end. And that's why I'm, I'm clamoring for more bowl bowl minutes because I want to see them play through adversity. Like, yes, the games matter. If they lost tonight, they would have dropped. Like, these games are not unimportant, but they're not playoff games. The same thing with Thad Young. Like, I would have loved to see five minutes. Just f- that That's the bar for me. <laughs> five minutes of Thad Young so I can see who he plays best with because Thad Young is a veteran, ultimate pro guy. Like, he's been around for a long time. He knows his role. He can pass. He can defend. He can rebound and all of that. You don't know who he has chemistry with when it comes to actual NBA games. You only can base it off of practice. It's like, I, I need to see bigger minutes. I need to see bigger numbers. But uh, speaking of big numbers, only one person has big numbers when it comes to the bets for our PHNX show. None of us made any bets and everybody did lose. So let's take a look at the bet MGM leaderboard. All right, chat, get your uh, jabs in at flex. Now I know a lot of people already have Espo still leading the way after everybody lost at $223 and 50 cents. Saul Currently dropping a little bit lower between a, behind $178.76. Lindsay further into the negative at $17.77. And then Flex. All the way down there, Flex. $186.01. And just uh just in his his memory, I would like to uh I'd like to just drop this for him. No flex. So that's just that's it. You know, that's all I have to drop there because I'm I'm sorry, Flex, man. I'm sorry. But yes, uh, everybody lost. But if you want to be a winner and you can be a winner, go ahead and download the BetMGM Sportsbook app. I personally do all of my betting on the BetMGM Sportsbook app. And right now, if you sign up with code PHNX, you can get a brand new offer with March Madness approaching. Sign up, deposit at least $10. That's $10 into your BetMGM Sportsbook account on BetMGM com or the BetMGM Sportsbook app, and you can place your first rager and receive up to fifteen hundred dollars back in bonus bets if that bet loses. Guys, it's literally free money. Like, yes, it's bonus bets, but you can still get that back if your bet loses. And I don't know about you, but when I lose, I still like to get something about it. Call it participation trophy culture. I still like to get something <laughs> if. I win. So make sure you guys right now download that BetMGM Sportsbook app. You can check out the show notes for details. Up to $1,500 paid back in bonus bets if your $10 deposit bet does not win. Those bonus bets do expire in seven days. And the offer is only for new customers. Like I said, check out the show notes for full details. And now you can hear the disclaimer. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Available in the U.S. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369-NEW-YORK. Call one 800 327 5050 Massachusetts. 21 plus only. Please gamble responsibly. Call 1-800-NEXT-UP Arizona. 1-800-BETS-OFF-IOWA. 1-800-270-7117 for Confidential Help Michigan, 1-800-981-0023 Puerto Rico. Subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. See BetMGM.com for terms. U.S. promotional offers not available in D.C., Mississippi, New York, Nevada, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. Get stuffed, Ontario. That's for all the Espo fanatics out there. No, I am not wearing purple pants. And uh, guys, it, it's pretty safe to say that, uh, that Flex has hit the floor when it comes to his betting and uh i think while he's down there he should remodel it and he can do that with empire today flooring guys now listen personally i don't own a house yet uh i want to working on it and uh when i do your, my flooring is going to be one of my biggest investments because right now i can't switch up my flooring in my apartment uh much to my chagrin and uh it's uh it's it's not exactly what you would like it's not very durable it's not the right color you know doesn't match everything that we have going on in our furniture and, and i would love to have the luxury to use empire today but if you do have the ability to do 
that and you're looking to get some new flooring, you should check out the easy, quick, and convenient Empire today. And right now, if you go to empiretoday.com slash PHNX, you can get $350 off. That's a pretty big chunk of change off of Empire's flooring. They have a lot of really great things for you to check out. One of them is their uh, virtual home visualizer to where you can like hold your phone up to your room and you can see what your floors are going to look like. Because if there's one thing you don't want to invest in, it's floors. And then you go, you know, they did a great job installing it like Empire Today does, but I'm looking at it and it just doesn't look the way that I wanted to. You don't want to go through all that time, that energy, and that effort just to get nothing. And you don't have to do that with Empire Today because they have great customer service. They're going to walk you through. They're not trying to upsell you on anything. And sure, there are other people who are out there trying to sell you floors, trying to do what Empire Today does, but they just... They just can't match Empire Today. And they also can't match $350 off. Big thing. EmpireToday.com slash PHNX to check that out. All right, guys. Let's uh, let's wrap up this very fun Suns postgame show. I hope the uh, chat is having as much fun as we are. I want to thank Aaron Edwards and Stephen Prigion to, uh, for joining me. Go ahead and hit that thumbs up button, guys. Make sure you subscribe. But the Suns' next game is going to be taking on the Milwaukee Bucks. And, and, and Stephen, I don't know if I heard this right. You're going to be in the building for that? Did, it, did, I, did I interpret that right? Yes, he did. I, I I would be in the building for that game. It'd be a fun one. To, it'd be a fun one to kind of gauge from a from a media perspective, but also just as a genuine fan of basketball. It's two of the best teams in the league. Some top end talents. Prime time Sunday. What more can you ask for? Well, I want to ask you. What are you looking for? I mean, look, the Suns just beat the Charlotte Hornets by eleven points and put up fifteen points in the in the fourth quarter. Man, you you can't play like that against Milwaukee. What are you expecting them to come out and shift from tonight's win? Yeah, uh, starting with setting the tone. I think that is, like, we, we talked about it a few times in this post-game episode today. You have to set a tone regardless of the opponent. That has to be a part of the Suns' identity, which is still kind of being shaped and shifted a little bit. You know, it's still not as concrete as you would desire for it to be at this mark in the season, in the latter third of it. Uh, so seeing them come out against the Milwaukee Bucks team that's finding its stride under Doc Rivers. Starting to see more pick and roll between Damian Lillard and Giannis Antetokounmpo. We're starting to see them grow more nuanced in their approach and their attack, manipulating space around it. We're also starting to see the Bucks as a whole play better defense, more connected, uh, much better communication, a ton more activity, showing a little bit more scheme versatility as they get into their rotations and lineups. Those things are going to add up to being a beast of a team for the Suns to go up against on Sunday, especially at their home court. So seeing the Suns come out, set a tone. Yusuf Nurkic had another 20-plus rebound game tonight. I think that's going to be equally as important in that game against Milwaukee because he has to set that tone in the paint. In addition to seeing, obviously, on offense players like Bradley Beal getting it going and getting downhill early as well. So seeing them put forth a two-way process where they're setting a tone on both ends of the floor is going to be important, maybe as important as anything else in that one. All right, Aaron, before I get to what you're looking for, I do want to mention with Nurk going out and setting the tone. For this entire week, the Suns have been playing some earlier games out there on the East Coast. It's been right around sunset. Uh, Yusuf Nurkic is fasting for Ramadan, and if you don't know what that entails, you basically fast from sunup to sundown every day for, for practically a month. And Sunday's game is going to be in the middle of the day out there in Milwaukee. It's a 10 o'clock tip here. I believe it's 1 o'clock out there where Steven's time is. And that's going to be a pretty big deal because in all of these games this week, since Ramadan has started, Nurk has been able to either eat something on the bench or eat something at halftime. And you've still seen his minutes go down. You have seen, especially in that Celtics game at the end, he got really gassed. So if, if Nurk comes out tomorrow and he doesn't set that tone, like we would expect him to, I don't want to, or Sunday, I don't want to see everybody overreacting to that because that might be so many more things at play. But, but besides that, Aaron, uh, over to you. What are you looking for, either taken from this game or looking ahead to the Bucks that the Suns should uh, maybe be focusing on on, on Sunday? Um, not focusing on, but I expect KD to come out pretty energetic on Sunday. I think he usually is pretty energetic against Milwaukee in general. Even on both sides of the ball, he usually takes it upon himself to guard Giannis either the first half or the second half or the entire game. And I think with just the day's rest, he's going to come out, especially after a game like today, I can see KD being really aggressive on Sunday and coming out like I thought Booker would come out today. I think the day's rest is going to help a lot. And I think just the fact that he always comes out and he's pretty hyped to play against Giannis and Dame and all those. I can yeah. see KD just coming out pretty good. Last time Suns and Bucks played uh, on the Suns home court earlier this season, that was a really good game. Uh, you definitely saw those guys battle it out. And KD has, has been really incredible in the last week and a half. 
like really good, almost averaging 40 points per game for a little stretch there. I don't expect him to dip that often, and, and sometimes that back-to-back -back is tricky. Uh, before we get out of here, Psycho Blue kind of echoes uh, something that I'm going to be looking for on Sunday. I've been looking for in every single game. However, he says it very differently. So, guys, I know you're not uh, familiar with Psycho Blue's game. Fantastic guy, one of the best supporters of the show that we have out there. He's a diehard. He's in our Discord. If you're not a part of the diehard Discord, what are you doing? Seriously, what are you doing? They are absolutely fantastic. One of the best parts about what we do here at PHNX. But here's Psycho Blue. Psycho Blue says, Basketball Cthulhu, I'm not doing the voice, Psycho Blue. Basketball Cthulhu doesn't know how the Eubanksies of the world get so much leeway from coaches. Like they won't share their fate being cast into basketball purgatory at season's end. Hashtag wins Thaddeus. <laughs> Listen, man, I am looking for a little bit of Thaddeus Young. I've made that pretty clear on this podcast. I just, I like to have an idea of everybody who who could contribute in the playoffs. I, I want to have a better idea of what they can do. And it's a really hard job to balance for Frank because, yes, you're in the middle of this playoff race in the West. There's a lot going on. You lose one, you win one, you move up, you move down. Like, that's a lot of pressure. But at the same time, the Suns are the type of team... Um, <laughs> see psycho blue said i didn't put in quotes because no one could do the voice that's right psycho blue there's a complete basketball could do the voice but i just got sidetracked anyway um i, I just i want to see what they have right and i think we can all agree that thaddeus young could bring something i'm looking for him to play and and like all of you guys said like i'm looking for them to set the tone i don't need a bad first quarter i don't need a bad fourth quarter and the the suns usually get up to play against the best losing to the celtics that might have uh might uh motivate them to play against the Bucks a little bit more. But speaking of motivation, y'all have me ready to run through a brick wall in chat. I appreciate all of you guys being here and checking into this very unique and different edition of the PHNX Suns postgame show. Guys, Aaron, Steven, I want to give the floor to you guys. You're volunteering your time with us. What do you have going on? Where can people find you? Let's uh, let's start with you, Aaron. Um, I have the Uncle Show at Valley Bar uh, March 31st. Me and Anwar Newton's going to be really fun. But I don't really care about me. You killed it today, man. Oh, stop. You did great. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you came out and you bombed. This Where is really getting, fun. Thank you. I'm going to get the attention <laughs> off of me. I'm, I'm, you pass it to me. I'm passing it right back. Where they can find you? Where can they find you on Twitter? On oh, Twitter. Uh, you yeah. can find me, uh, Aaron Ed, A-Y-R-O-N-E-D. Um, I'm usually just talking about how the nice guys need a sequel. So if you want to see that. <laughs> Just come on through. Hey, uh, Ryan Gosling casting the MCU. <laughs> Maybe uh, Nice Guys is going to be in that universe, huh? <laughs> and uh, speaking of Nice Guys, uh, you can just tell that this guy, Steven, is one of the nicest in basketball media. Not only is he one of the nicest, and uh, he's definitely one of the smartest. Somebody I've been following for a very, very, very long time. So, Steven, tell the people where they can find you and uh, what you're up to. Yeah, uh, I'm going to do the same thing as Aaron and preface by saying uh, great job to you, not just hosting, but also producing. And also watching the game and being able to articulate what you're seeing. Uh, for the people in the chat that are not familiar with the things that go on behind the scenes, that is one hell of a task to be able to execute. So I want to give you your flowers, Eric, before I even say anything about myself. That was on my heart. Shout out to Aaron as well. Aaron, you did your thing, my guy. I appreciate the time I spent with y'all. Um, y'all can find me on Twitter at StayTrueS.3. Uh, doing film threads, film sessions, all of that fun stuff. Uh, you can also find me right in at Bright Side of the Sun doing game recaps, diving into the weeds on X's and O's, um, trends, all of that fun stuff, as well as on Twitter, or as well as on YouTube, rather. Uh, my first name, Steven, uh, last name, Prejean, and then last name as well, my hyphenated last name, Gardner, and then number three on YouTube. I do all my film sessions on there. I also clip them and put them on YouTube. So that's pretty much all I got going on in addition to the Take That for Data podcast with Gerald. Shout out to Gerald for being a newlywed. You know, that's dope. That's a great life experience. We all likely uh, want to get there at some point. So shout out to Gerald. We'll be back probably the next week or the week after that with that. But yeah, that's what I got going on. And if you have not listened to the Take That for Data podcast, like I, I'm usually the one I'm just sitting in the Zoom and I'm, I'm just recording them and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I, I'm just getting so much smarter, <laughs> just so just so much smarter, like genuinely, guys, uh, you guys are awesome chat. Everybody in here is awesome. Please make sure that you hit the thumbs up. Please make sure you subscribe. I will be back producing on Sunday with our usual cast of characters. They're all boogieing on the dance floor right now, drinking some Four Peaks. I'm very sure 
We had a lot of them have taken some OGs as well. Uh, it's, it's a good time to celebrate, guys. Big shout out to Gerald Borgay. Uh, I know how much work has gone into this wedding. I know how excited everybody here was to do it. I appreciate the opportunity to do this. I've been a lifelong Phoenix Suns fan. I followed a lot of these guys on, on Suns Twitter since uh, I don't want to make people feel old, but since I was in high school, like I, this is a, kind of a really cool uh, culmination point uh, for me. And hopefully, you know, there's more in the future. But of course, it's a great time producing every single show being in talking about the suns observing the game everything like that uh again make sure you hit that like button and remember guys follow at phnx underscore suns you can follow me at e-r-i-k-r-u-b-y and uh this man yes this man is getting married today win 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 curve everything else win 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 <laughs> ahoy hoy <laughs> Y'all silly like the mayor. 